It says right. it's live, Sean. Yeah, this is live. Go ahead and keep talking, Keith. Go ahead and start start it up. What I mean, okay, so there's people there? Uh, not, I can't tell yet. I'm about to check that out. <laughs> Bear with us, folks. Have... This is our first time. This is our first time, everybody, and I'm sorry if uh, anybody has uh, become frustrated with it. If, if you have, join the club because we're frustrated with it too, trying to learn this technology. Um, first off, I've been doing this a long time, and for this old dinosaur, this, these new things kind of scare me, but it enables us to be able to reach out and have a better connection with our viewers, our friends, and, and our fan base. Uh, that's one thing that what we always strive to do is to have a better relationship with the people that take the time and watch our show. And so uh, when they explained to me what this whole process was here, I said, heck yeah, let's try to do it. So again, I apologize about the technical difficulties here and us getting started on this late, but uh, we'll uh, do the best we can to give you as much good stuff as we can the remainder of the time. So Keith, uh, how, how busy have you been this last month or so? I have uh, I've been on the road almost constantly. You know, when deer season's over or when hunting season's over, uh, a lot of people think that that maybe it, the you know it's time for me to kick back. But that's the time that the business really starts. Uh, there's a lot of shows going on in January, starting with the ATA show, the Archery Trade Association show, and uh, I've got to go to that. Uh, and and I love it. It's like a kid walking in a candy store for anybody who loves archery. Uh, and so anyway, I started with that. Then after that, I had a uh, oh gosh, where'd I go? I had a safari, safari club, club show. There was a safari club show in Dallas. Went to that, and I lined up some super good trips that we've got for this coming fall. Uh, I went to a uh, actual to one of the biggest deer auctions in the country up in Illinois. And then when I got done there, uh, there was a the shot show. And so I've just been running like crazy, just doing business. Hey, what kind of cool stuff did you see at the archery show? I know you told me about uh, some kind of like the fastest, uh, was it the one of the fastest crossbows you ever saw? Was that from Darton or something like that? Yeah, the the, uh, the folks at Darton Archery, I I, I, I told them, I said, y'all are like the Rodney Dangerfield archery business. I mean, it's, it's, it, what's amazing to me is that they have been around for forever, and uh, a lot of people just kind of overlook them, but the technology that... Uh, is in a lot of the the big name bow companies uh, product came from uh, from Darton Archery and the owner of Darton he is uh, proprietary information that uh, I mean technology that really all these bow companies today are using his uh, invention to to build their products and so I went by the Darton booth and met those guys and I got to shoot their crossbow. It, it's amazing. I mean, I've been shooting crossbows a long time, and I've been shooting lots of different people's crossbows, but the this one particular bow is is a phenomenal piece of equipment. Uh, they're going to send me one so I can field test it, and as soon as I do what the plan is, I'm going to do a uh, product review, and we'll have it on our YouTube channel. Well, that's pretty cool. Uh, Colton, what did you see? that was? Because uh, I know you went with him to the ATA show, right? Yeah, it was um, it was a pretty neat experience for me. I'd actually never been before. It was in Nashville, and it was nine degrees. It was in the middle of that big, heavy uh, storm that they had come through. So it was pretty cold for us. But uh, there was a lot of neat products. Darton had a number of different really neat crossbows. They've got a really expansive line. And then there was something that uh, a little adapter you could put on your binoculars, your spotting scope, or your rifle that allows you to actually film your kill shot through your scope on your iPhone. So that was a pretty cool thing. I actually tested it out and uh, it works. It's a pretty cool piece of equipment. So in terms of something that's not very expensive that most people can afford and you always want to tell the story of your hunts, I thought that it's called the iScope. That was a pretty neat piece of equipment. Keep so well, there's a couple other little things I want to tell you about. I found a, uh, I mean just some little stuff and I like to go down in the downstairs in the, the new innovation section. It's where the guys uh, and gals wind up, they come up with new products and hopefully one day they're going to be mainstream products. But uh, down there, there was a, a really neat uh, glove. And a lot of times, I mean, this time of year when it's cold and you kill a deer or an elk or whatever and you've got to do some field dressing, you're going to get pretty dirty and pretty cold. Well, this glove comes all the way up to your shoulders. I mean, it's a full length glove. And, uh, and uh, 
and they and it comes in a pair, and so uh, it's a it's a field dressing glove, and you can put it's it right the, over your jacket. It's called the Big Game Gut Glove, and it's a little bit it's a lot thicker actually than a, a dishwashing glove, the ones that come up about halfway up your forearm. Anyway, it's a cool deal, and then I found a, a tree stand called the uh, the Gecko 360, and if you in, and you know down in Texas, like we have a lot of crooked trees, we're not like a lot of these places that have straight up trees, so it's really difficult for us to hang a lot of these stands on these crooked trees. But this Gecko 360, it's got a swivel on it, allows you to adjust it to where you can hang it just about on any tree. And those are just some of the new products that I saw in that uh, new section that I think are going to be picked up down the road. They're going to be popular. What What do you think about those guys? They're real active on Twitter with you. They like you a lot. Yeah, they they they're good people. You know, the 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 thing is, I think that a lot of people that get in this business, they they hey, they love the outdoors, they love hunting, they're good people, and we have a lot in common. And I've been doing this so long that what I see is I see a lot of these people that wind up getting in it, and they got big hearts and 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 big dreams and and, and great ideas, and they come in this business, and they're they the one thing is they're they're also big time naive and. I want to sit down there with them, and I want to coach them. I want to help them. I want to give them some advice that will help them be successful because nobody wants to see a failure. Nobody wants to be a failure, and I want to be able to help people succeed. And in this industry, uh, it, it's hard just like in any, any industry, and so with 30 years of experience, I want to help people succeed. Hey, Keith, uh, you know you know Scott Bachmeyer, right? You know he's oh, yeah. been, you've been hanging out with him for a long time. Mm -hmm. he, just he just posed the question in the uh, – in the comments section on the on the event page, he says he's got a buddy in South Dakota who's a huge hunter, but he's leading a group of people to, I guess, ban crossbows from archery season or altogether. And he says that the legislation is actually considering it, and he'd like to know what your take on that is. And he he says he sees it as hunters against hunters. What what do you think about that? Uh, you know what I think about it. I, 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 I am. I know you do. I'm saddened. I'm, it saddens me to see hunters against hunters. Uh, whether you hunt for ducks or bucks or turkey or elk, uh, we're all hunters. Whether you hunt with a muzzleloader or a bow or a crossbow, we're all hunters. Uh, thank God we live in a country where we have freedom to choose what we hunt, how we hunt. And, and it just amazes me how some hunters want to become the Gestapo and want to be able to say to other hunters, nope, you know, my way of hunting is better than your way of hunting. Uh, and, and, and they do that legally, and they get away with it. And the reason why they get away with it is because people stand back and let them get away with it. I am an activist. I encourage other people to become activists. Our world has changed in some places. It's not a real pretty place because – we have become victims. We have become complacent, and 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 we have allowed these things to happen to us, and and not just in hunting, but in, with freedom in general. And so I think as as a hunter, we all have to stand up. We have to say, wait a minute, stop fighting against one another. If you don't like crossbows, that's cool. Don't shoot them. Okay, right. we need as many hunters as we can to get into the hunting industry. And I don't care how they hunt. We need hunters. And once they get in, guess what? Maybe they'll put that horizontal bow down and pick up a vertical bow. But if you can't get them in, they're going to go into tennis or something else, and they're not even going to become a hunter. It's kind I of think sad. It's also, I think it's also the crossbow is a great tool from a retainment perspective, which you talk about all the time, making sure that people who can't physically pull back a bow anymore are still able to get out in the woods and hunt. And I think if we have the opportunity – at a state level to make sure that those people have a way to hunt. We ought to take every opportunity we can. So instead of working to make sure the crossbow isn't legal, we ought to make sure the crossbow is legal during the archery season. That way more people can stay out of field. We need to encourage more people to go to the field. And we need to encourage more people to go to the Capitol to, to take up issues and to defend sportsmen's right and their freedom to be able to choose how to hunt. That's a good. That, those are very good points. I mean, you know me. I mean, you're preaching to the choir as far as me goes. I agree with you. Um, now we had some really cool stuff that came up this year. I mean, worldwide, we did some actually international hunts. I don't know both you and Colton were involved with the hunts in New Zealand. I think that was the highlights from January as far as the high road goes. The episodes. Um, I mean, just what was your take on it? I mean, we heard from you on the show, but. 
I mean, how how awesome was that to be able to go do what you were doing out there? I've been to New Zealand now four times. I I have I love it. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever been that doesn't love it. The only bad thing about going to New Zealand, there's two bad things. First off, it's an 11-hour flight from LA. That's a bad thing. And the next thing is, when you go, you're going to go back. It's absolutely the most breathtaking, beautiful, uh, inspiring place you could ever go as an outdoorsman. Everywhere you look is beautiful. It's, I call it video rich. You can't point the camera in an ugly area. Uh, the people are wonderful. The, 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 the weather's wonderful. Every single thing about it is wonderful. And so uh, to be able to go, like I said, in my fourth time, uh, I just I wanted to take Colton. And so Colton wound up, he served as a cameraman and did an outstanding job. And, uh, and it was just something I could share with him, and I'm sure that uh, he'll be going back someday too. Yeah, when you're on a trip like that, time really flies because you just you soak in every minute of it. From you know the tar hunting where we were up in the helicopter, I had never been in a helicopter before, never filmed out of a helicopter before, and we're going up hunting the Himalayan tar in the Alps of New Zealand. It was just um, it was an incredible experience for us, and it was the kind of challenge that we like to go on. And, and capturing it all on video was not only a good challenge, but I think I think the viewers really appreciate that. I mean, it was a heck of a hunt. Hey, I just want to say once again to the audience, folks, we really appreciate you all hanging in with us you know, through the uh, yeah. uh, technical difficulties. That was kind of a, a cluster, so to speak. You know what? And uh, and uh, this is the first time we've done it, like Keith mentioned earlier. Um, but we're so far we're getting some good feedback and some good questions. Um, but uh, Keith, uh, or Keith, now I don't know what you have planned for this fall as far as where you're going. Because I do know one thing, it's big Africa. You could tell me a little bit about that. But what, where are you plan? Where else are you planning on going this year? Hold on, we can't overlook Africa. I mean, it's just, <laughs> you just can't blow past Africa like that. I mean, come on. Uh, I've been to Africa several times, and uh, Africa is beautiful. It is. Uh, it, I love going over there and seeing different cultures. Um, it's it's more than the hunt. When when I go when I went there the first time I, I for the first time in my life I got to see what really poor people are like. Um, they're poor poor people over here are fat. I mean poor people over there die. They they starve to death and they die. Uh, the hunter has such an important role in all the countries in Africa uh, and and to the economy and to the to the people uh, and to the to the future of wildlife and conservation. And I think that we get a bad rap when it comes to the uh, animal rights people and the PETA groups and all that. They think all we're doing is going over there and just killing animals. But I'll tell you this, the, the people that, are, that really uh, leave a bad taste in the Africans' mouths are the people that go on photo safaris. The people that go on photo safaris go over there and they take pictures of the people and the poor black people. They take all these pictures and they, and they put the camera right in their face and take all these pictures of them. And they leave with nothing except a bad taste. They don't tip. They don't do anything. The hunter, when he leaves, literally, I left everything except the shirt off my back. I left everything, all the clothes I took, all the extra shoes I took. I, I left the meat from the animals. I, I tipped everybody. I came back with nothing except a wonderful video and, and wonderful memories. And so uh, the hunter plays a significant role in the future of Africa. And uh, so I'm going over there taking Colton uh, the first 12 days of, of uh, June. And then uh, after we get back from that, we're going to go on a, on a uh, handgun hunt we're doing uh, for bear up in Alaska. We did this hunt last year, and uh, the, the ice off was real late. And uh, so every, everything was great on this bear hunt, except the bears didn't show up. But we had a really good time. Um, and, but after that, uh, we start on the uh, videoing the uh, deer and wildlife story show, all the deer farms we go to. Mm -hmm. We start on that. And afterwards, the first hunt of the fall starts out with an elk hunt in Colorado. And it's an archery elk hunt, and I'm looking forward to that. I haven't done that in several years. And if anybody out there uh, wants a high, a real natural high, go call in a bull elk and stab you with an arrow. And I guarantee you that's one of those kind of things you just can't get enough of. And it's not about the size. It's about the way you do it. That's pretty awesome. Uh, you mentioned deer and wildlife stories. I know that uh, 
I know there's some big stuff in the plan in the works for this year. Uh, what 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 do you have in store for the for the audience, Keith? I mean, what what's pretty cool? I mean, uh, we did the CWD documentary last year. I mean, is that everything that could have been said about CWD? Sean, that's so good. I, I want to point out that the chronic wasting disease is what what he's talking about. CWD. Uh, and, and CWD affects every sportsman, uh, or and if it hasn't affected you yet, it will. It is a it is a disease that uh, is a it's a brain disease that, that animals that the deer family get the elk, uh, deer, uh, moose that they get they basically get holes in their brain, and if they live long enough, once they have this condition this disease, and I think it's more of a condition than a disease, but once they get into this condition. If they live long enough, they, they deteriorate, and then all of a sudden start doing wacky things. They stand with a broad stance, and they, they don't eat, and they, they wither away. It's a, it's a very ugly thing. Uh, and, and there are some animals that have gotten it and that die, uh, both in the wild and, and uh, in deer farms. Uh, there's not a lot of, of uh, information on it, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, a lot of people wind up thinking that CWD is caused from deer farms and caused from animals that are in... A close proximity within small confined places where they've got high density. That if if that, if that was a the case, uh, then how did it show up out in West Texas in the mule deer population where there's about an animal for every square mile? Or uh, in Wyoming where there are no deer farms? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, CWD is, is it's a deer disease uh, that that has no boundaries. It's it's now showing up in places that you know that just it's never been there before. Like Colton says, there's no deer farms. Uh, so where did it come from? They still don't know. Can it be stopped? They still don't know. But what we do know is that the government regulations upon the private landowner, the deer farmer, uh, can be so bad that if CWD is found on your piece of property, uh, it can cause you to, to, to literally lose your piece of property, lose your livelihood, and, uh, and, and for what? I look at it, it's a political disease. I think people are overreacting to it. We're doing a, a new CWD updated uh, show that's going to be out here soon. I think one disease that affects white-tailed deer a thousand times more than CWD, maybe two thousand times more, is EHD. It's a it's a disease that deer from Missouri and Michigan all the way down into Mexico get. It's an epizootic hemorrhagic disease, and and they get it from a midge net. These midge nets bite them, and they die. And that's a disease that affects everybody too, because wildlife populations are decimated by EHD. They're not decimated by CWD. So anyway, that's that's big political stuff, right? Sure there. is. Um, we've got, you know, I mean, a lot of people think this high, these high fences are are causes for that, but I mean, you know, we'll address that in the show, I'm sure. But you know, uh, we have one guy on here. Uh, it says Andy. I think it's Ebenezer or uh, Eisenhower. I, I can't I can't tell what how to sell, say his name. Uh, just kidding, Andy. Uh, Enzenauer, <laughs> not Nyer. I, I'm not sure. Uh, anyways, he says, you know, he says people. You, we had a lot of people that have high fence ranches and import exotics like Sika, Nilgai, things like that. What do you think the impact is that that kind of that those kind of exotics have to the native wildlife if these critters get loose and breed? I mean, is there any impact? I mean, do you think that that is an issue? Um, what are your thoughts on that? It, it's an issue. Uh, habitat is what we've got to be more concerned about than anything. Uh, as a wildlife manager, as a steward of the resource, we need to be concerned about wildlife habitat because once a wildlife habitat is gone, uh, nothing will live there anymore. And uh, you start taking a look at it, you think uh, where we are right now, uh, where you are and I am and all the listeners, the listeners are, a man has come in and destroyed habitat. And what we have to do is we have to realize that animals destroy habitat as well. And so when you start bringing in these species of animals that may not be indigenous, they may be indigenous, but when you bring them in at levels that the habitat cannot support that number of animals, uh, you have to be more concerned about the habitat than the animals at that point. Because once the habitat is gone, sometimes it will never come back. Sometimes it takes generations for it to come back. And that's the reason why in Texas, in arid areas, Oklahoma, uh, some areas that didn't get that Mother Nature is pretty cruel, that's the reason why we supplemental feed our animals because we want to have a carrying capacity that's large enough 
that uh, that we can see animals when we go out, yet that's not so large that it destroys the habitat. So that's the reason why we supplemental feed. Um, Colton, uh, you, you're kind of a you're a young guy, and and you know there's a lot of people that uh, you know this is kind of another question that we had posed on the on the comments page. Like, you're a young guy. There's a lot of people that are new hunters, uh, new to the industry. Now you've been around hunting your whole life. Um, what would you, or even Keith, what, what would you say to somebody who doesn't know many other hunters, how, how do they go about finding private hunting land instead of public? Because there's a lot of places like in states, I mean Texas is one, we've got very few public lands. It's hard to get into a public land and find any kind of uh, good hunting unless you're doing dove hunting. That's about the only good thing to hunt public land for here in Texas. Uh, what do you say to somebody that's looking for private hunting land? What can they do to find better places? Do you want to answer that, Daddy, or I'll start if you want. Uh, Colton, go ahead. Yeah, it used to be in the old days, you know, you could go knock on somebody's door, and uh, the farmer down the road would let you hunt there. And uh, I think those days are pretty well gone for most of the country, and that's unfortunate because uh, a few hunters have given us a bad rap and they're just people don't trust each other the way they used to. It is difficult to get sometimes access to good hunting land because the landowner wants to be paid for it. I don't blame them one bit. But if uh, you do some know someone, that help that's helpful. But if you can scout an area out, maybe talk to some friends at the feed store or the co-op. Uh, get to know a few people in town. I think you'll find that if you can uh, show that you're an honest, stand-up guy, most landowners will let you come in. You know, you may have to help out on the farm or on their ranch, but uh, you know, it can be worth it. If you can gain access to some good ground, it's out there, it's available. But again, that's going to depend on where you are. You know, Texas is 97% privately owned, so chances are if you're going to hunt, uh, you're probably going to have to do so on private land. Sean, I want to point out something I, that, that I see that as sportsmen, that we fall into a trap that a lot of sportsmen, I think, have, a, have this uh, uh, entitlement mentality when it comes to wildlife. They think wildlife just happens. Uh, they think that they're entitled to it because they can go out and buy a license. Um, wildlife costs money. Wildlife needs to live somewhere. They need to eat, needs to eat stuff and drink stuff and have, have refuge. Uh, and, and when we have um, a society of people, and, and, and hunters included, that don't contribute to, uh, to supporting the species, all they want to do is take. And they, and they might say, well, look, you know, uh, I bought my fifty dollar license. You know, it has. You know, I can kill in Alabama. I kill a, a a buck and a doe a day, or whatever the deal is. I'm thinking, are you kidding me? What can you do for fifty bucks now? You can't take your family out to eat. But there are people that buy a hunting license and really truly expect to be able to fill those tags. Yet they don't do anything to put anything back. I believe, like Colton said, uh, go talk to people. If you want to hunt, uh, realize you know what it's going to cost you something. It's just not going to happen. It's not going to be out there like like air or freedom. You know, freedom costs us something. We have brave men and women that fight. And so when you want to hunt someplace, go out and meet a farmer and get off your butt and go help him set fence posts. Go you know, get on the tractor and help him put a food plot in. Odds are he's going to say, here are the keys to the place. Please come hunt and bring your family. Uh, it all gets down to relationships. And so go out and make relationships with people, and, uh, and I think you'll be surprised about the opportunities that it will create. That's some pretty awesome stuff. I mean, I, that, that's something I struggle with. I'm a, I'm a relatively new hunter compared to you guys. My dad wasn't a hunter. He was a fisherman. And uh, as, as I've told you, Keith, you know, I mean, you're kind of my dad when it comes to hunting. You know, I, I, uh, you're the one that has introduced me to it. And, uh, it's, and it, it, it is a problem to find those places. But you're right. You have to contribute. I agree with that. Um, we got a few more questions. I don't want to spend too long because I, I don't want to go too long. I mean, we could just go on and on about these discussions. Yeah. Um, but we do have a few more uh, questions. Uh, one guy, uh, Geo Ogbum, I hope I'm saying these names right, uh, says, uh, Hey, Keith, we've, we take vets and kids hunting. We set up a charity to help with this, but I'd like to know where we can pick up a good used camera to film them hunting. So. He's wanting to know, like, uh, what cameras, you know, obviously he likes the camera, you know, the quality of video he gets from us that he sees us doing. Uh, what cameras do we use, Keith? 
Okay, we use a Panasonic uh, HD cameras. The the P one seventy is what we've been using lately, and, and we're real happy with it. You know what I would recommend? I, I don't know what the what the end uh, use is for this video. If it's going to be a YouTube deal or just a uh, home movies, but uh, call my friends over at Campbell Cameras. They're out of Illinois, and uh, and talk to them. Explain to them what you what you're doing. Uh, they may have a line on some used equipment. Uh, I think they get it from time to time, but they're good guys. They're very knowledgeable about the outdoor person, what equipment is needed to videotape people. And if you tell them what you're doing, odds are they can help you. Okay. Um, I just want to do a few more questions, Keith. I, I don't want to go past six. Okay. Six o'clock. We've got a few. We've got like eight minutes left. Um, but uh, let's see. Uh, Walton Sellers. Uh, says anyone who follows your show can see that you're passionately dedicated to the survival of hunting as an outdoor sport. How likely is it that your children will follow in your footsteps as far as that dedication? I think we're already seeing that with Colton and Maddie. I mean, uh, t talk about what Colton and Maddie are doing and how proud you are of them as far as their acti their um, activism in uh, in hunting. First off, Walton, thank you for participating, buddy. I mean, uh, one of these days I look forward to coming over to Louisiana and uh, eating some boudin with you. But I know that, uh, you know, getting to, to that question, Colton and Maddie, like me, uh, they don't remember their first hunting trip, their first fishing trip. It didn't start with a gun. It didn't start with a rod and a reel. It started with uh, just going. Um, passion is something that... that Successful people, there's not one person I know that's successful that does not have passion. And passion is something that you, you just can't go to the passion machine and get some. You can't go get a passion bar and get it. Passion is something that, that, that you've got to give yourself. You've got to dig down inside and find out what truly it is that you're passionate about. It's something that, that I think that passionate people surround themselves with passionate people like successful people do. Uh, Colton and Maddie have have uh, have grown up with uh, two parents that are passionate. We are very uh, dedicated and very hard on them. We we don't want just normal kids. We want exceptional kids. Uh, we have taught them uh, right from wrong, and and they know where we stand on literally every single subject. And so when we step outdoors and we start enjoying all these gifts that we've been given to take care of. They see how much we love and respect the, that time that we have, and the time that, and and all these gifts. And so, it it's contagious. It's something that they they can't help but pick it up. And so I know without a shadow of a doubt. I mean, when Colt and Maddie were born, I gave got them each a lifetime hunting license. I mean, so they'll never have to buy another one. People said, well, what happens if they don't hunt? I said, oh, they'll hunt. But they aren't, and so I don't have to worry about that. I, what I've done is I've given uh, I've given them the opportunity, the the foundation, to uh, carry forth, and uh, and if they want to enter the outdoor arena, uh, then they've got the knowledge and the the skills to be able to do it. If they don't, I did the best I could, and at least they know that their father and mother loves the outdoors, and uh, we wanted to give them the the best upbringing we could. All right, we got time for a couple more questions. I mean that's pretty awesome. I mean that's that's just some great stuff, Keith. Uh, Chris Ivy, you know that guy. Uh, he's a oh yeah. He's Hi, active Chris. on the, he's active on the Facebook page. Uh, he's a nice guy. Uh, I'm friends with him on Facebook myself. He says, Keith, he, I'm currently getting into the deer breeding slash stalker business. Should I keep the deer on the same feed as what the previous owner had them on? That's Chris, an interesting when question. Your place on Friday, we'll talk about this. But <laughs> to answer your question, uh, you don't want to go cold turkey and move a deer off of one feed onto another. I don't think that's good. Okay, that's like like people. You don't want to change your diet just instantly. Okay, I think you do it in moderation. And so, uh, what I would recommend, I mean, look, I'm, I'm wearing a record rack cap, and I, I I've been using record rack for many many years, and our deer do very well on it. But there, there's some other good feeds out there too, and and I don't want I'm not going to knock anybody's stuff. I'm just going to say that the, the the most important thing that we want to do is provide the best nourishment we can for the deer. And so 
Uh, when I get over there Friday, we'll look at it. But if you want to change your feed, do not do it all of a sudden. What I would do is change it slowly. I uh, do some research, do some Q and A, find out uh, what other people would recommend, and and then uh, kind of wean them off of what they're what they're currently on over to what you want them to be on. And one thing that as a wildlife manager, I will tell you this: uh, data is everything. Data is is uh, the Bible. It's gonna it's the holy grail. You've got to you got to have data. And so as a ranch manager, ranch owner. We keep a lot of data. How much did the deer weigh? Uh, how old were they and all? Because what we'll find out through the years, we'll see body weights improve, or we should. And if we don't see body weights improve, we want to find out why. And uh, it could be nutrition, but it could be the fact that, uh, you know, that maybe the animal got sick too. So data is everything in wildlife management. Well, I think I think we're good down to our last question. Uh, it's uh, We got three minutes left, but... Uh, it's okay if we go a little bit over on this question because uh, I'm going to ask both you and Colton this. Um, it's from a guy named by the name of Brad Steele, uh, and uh, he says, "I see that your hashtag on the show is the joy of the hunt. What does that mean to you?" And I think uh, uh, Colton, I'll, I'll I'll throw that to you first so that Keith can end the show up. So Colton, what does it mean to you when you hear the joy of the hunt? That hashtag. You know, my dad talks sometimes about going full circle and hunting. You know, you want to start out hunting, uh, you just want to go outside. Then you want to kill a lot something, you want to kill a lot of something, you want to kill the biggest something, and then you just want to go outside. I think the joy of the hunt for me is the realization that every time we can spend in the woods is precious. We should really cherish that time, and, and God's given us a great gift. We've been given... Uh, each other. We've been given nature. He's given us uh, the variety of species we have. And just to be able to enjoy that for me is the joy of the hunt. Sure, the kill is important, no doubt. Everybody likes that. Uh, but it's the whole experience, the camaraderie, the fellowship, uh, the ability to uh, be really in God's backyard, I think of nature as, I think is uh, really the most important thing to me. And I consider that to be the joy of the hunt. So Keith, what what is the joy in the hunt to you? I mean, I mean that you could go. I, I've heard you go on and on about this. You know, I, I'm we I I'm a big believer in feelings and and talking about feelings. Uh, I know that that's not real cool to a lot of people, and you know the uh, everybody seems to be real guarded about their feelings. But you know the the joy of the hunt is all about feelings. It's all about it's all about it, just the feeling of peace and tranquility and and. Uh, and, and happiness, uh, and I liken it to, uh, to you know, uh, Colton, someday you'll know what I'm talking about, but when you fall in love and you hug your wife and you hug your wife and you just close your eyes and you hug your wife because it's just hugging your wife. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just that feeling. I mean, it's just nothing else can take that place. And so the joy of the hunt is about getting out and hugging nature and being a part of nature and loving every single thing about it. And yes, when you pull the trigger and you kill an animal, you love that animal. And it's the hardest thing to explain to people. How could you do that? How could you love that animal and take its life? I sit down after I take an animal, and, and Sean, you've seen this. Colton, you've seen this. I get down and hold the animal. I, I, I love the animal. I mean, the animal gave his life for me. And I will not take an animal's life unless I... Unless it means something to me, they're not hairy targets. They're a, they're a, a living animal, and so I respect them. I appreciate them, and I want to pay them the most respect and dignity. And that's all part of joy of the hunt. So, real quick to close out the show, I'm looking. I, I'm turning around here and looking at the schedule that we had the last few weeks. You know, we had your your Wyoming antelope hunt. In your antelope hunt in Wyoming. We had uh, the stag hunt and the tar hunt in New Zealand. Uh, your mule deer hunt with Brad in Montana. Uh, and then I think this week that's airing uh, this week on the Pursuit Channel, that's uh, channel 604 for uh, 604 on DirecTV and 393 on Dish Network, folks. <laughs> or, or you can go to our YouTube channel and watch them. Or our YouTube channel. Yeah. But th this week that's airing is a uh, is, uh, Crossed off, which is which was the uh, whitetail hunt in in, uh, in Canada. So Keith, from those hunts, what was the one highlight that you had? I, I I'm kind of putting you on the spot here, but what was the one highlight? If from all those hunts, which one 
do you wish you could just play over and over and over again? Uh, when I was in Montana with Brad, uh, it was to mule deer hunt. Uh, well, I go up to Montana the same place every year and have for many years. I love it. I love the country and the people, and just it's, it's I love it. Um, but there's a little cabin up there, and they they've got a beautiful lodge. It's got Wi-Fi and everything down below, down several miles down below. But there's a little cabin. Doesn't have any power, and you know doesn't have any electricity run to it or anything. Got a, no heat. Got a little wood burner. I want to stay there when I go up there because that, to me, is the joy of the hunt. And going up there with Brad and being able to sit there and watch these snowflakes that were just like the size of silver dollars come down, and it snowed like nine inches that night. And, and looking out there at that beautiful country, it's like I never wanted to leave, and I can't wait to go back. So out of all the places I went so far, that would have to be it. That's awesome. Oh well, someday, Keith. I think I, I think I'd like to go with you one of these days, and uh, up there to Bear Paw Mountains. It's just a beautiful place. I, I kind of agree with you. The shows that you and uh, the camera guys come back with, you know, nine times out of ten are some of the most beautiful shows that we have every year. And uh, it, it's it's something that I'd like to do someday myself. Uh, you know, it's one of those things I have to save up for. <laughs> but but it's a, it's a bucket list thing, and uh, I don't know, Keith, do you have any closing words? Do you want to close out the, the little hangout here? Yeah, I want to tell everybody, first off, uh, I want to apologize about the technical difficulties we had going in this deal. It was uh, it's embarrassing, it's frustrating, and, uh, and it's certainly something that we weren't planning on, and we will strive next time to do a better job. I want to tell you all thank you for, for watching the show, for participating in this, and for, for being exceptional. I want, to, I want to tell you that you know I want to for us as a company with our, our programs and all and our social networking stuff, I want to be able to reach out to you. I want to help you any way that we can. I want to be able to have a, a good relationship with the viewers, listen to them, and to be able to, uh, to, to kind of work in this thing together. You know, I think that uh, when we disagree on things and we're going to disagree on things down the road, uh, that's, that's cool. We've got to look for the common thread that unites us all. And I just want to encourage everybody to uh, to take the high road all the time. Watch the show, participate, and again, uh, we're going to do this down the road here pretty quick. And I hopefully we got the bugs worked out. So thank y'all for participating. Yeah, I, th I think we've got it figured out, uh, Colton. Uh, uh, just uh, I'll I'll, say, I'll send it off to you. Uh, if you if you want to find Keith on Facebook, where do you go? Yeah, go to facebook.com forward slash Keith Warren Outdoors. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at The High Road TV. And uh, obviously most of y'all are on our YouTube right now, but it's uh, youtube.com forward slash Outdoor Adventures. And, you know, Sean and I have some pretty cool videos in the works coming up for y'all. So just make sure and tune into our YouTube channel. We've got some exclusive online series, and I think that they're going to be pretty cool, pretty informative and pretty entertaining. Well, I had a great time, guys. Uh, I hope uh, hope everybody else did too. Keith, uh, thanks for doing this. I've been wanting to do something like this for a while, you know, for the the web stuff, and uh, you know, I I really appreciate you uh, let me participate on it. All right, Sean. Thanks. Good job, bud. See you, All Cole. Right. Take care. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, and tune in again. Yep.